the role in that or in the me, it's of course always a pleasure to be able to have Ines in the same classroom at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, some disclaimer. So, I, I, I'm not uh, a proudist, okay? So, I, I don't uh, study really random works and groups per se, but I do use um, uh, question boundaries uh, to uh, prove the GDP theorems. And I uh, certainly use you know, uh, um, quite a few results from the paper by Klimanovich and Gershik, you know, the 83 paper, the celebrated paper. And so we'll see that also in my talk, this will, uh, this, this will appear. So before moving to the uh, non commutative setting, because when we say non commutative it may sound you know, a bit um, uh, mysterious, let me just give some motivation and then uh, we'll sort of involve the last two settings. And for me, the last two settings will be the commutative setting. Again, I think uh, the setup will, will be always the same. So we take. Um, uh, G1 and G2, so there will be a uh, lot of impacts in the of groups. And uh, on them, I will choose uh, some admissible points. Yeah. 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 And then what I will do is uh, form the product, which is uh, the G1 times G2. And so this one is that this it generates a single product. Yes, yeah, so for me it means that uh, it means uh, three things. It means that um, the measure is uh, to, to say, to, to, to say uh, simply, so um, it means the measure mu is absolutely continuous with respect to the car measure. Uh, in support, you have like the neighborhood of the identity, say, and it, it generates the, the, the group that's a similar. Okay. okay. So you really see uh, everything in the group you know, when, you, when you walk at home. You know, even simple, you can take it, you know, absolutely continuous. I mean, you can take it equivalent to the car measure for me, it's good. Um, and then we take the to the point measure. Which is again invisible. And then what we are going to do with this, we are going to denote by uh, bi, say, new bi. This will be the uh, gi, new i, uh, person boundary. Okay, so this is the gi, new i, person boundary. And <clears throat> an interesting uh, and interesting result that I will use is. Uh, was written by Vadim uh, and Jerome. That in fact, uh, so from the point number four, the fact that when if I write B new B, the, the G new person boundary, then what we have is that we have isomorphism of the person boundary of G and the product of the person boundaries. So what we have is like, uh, we have isomorphism between these two spaces. And this is a, a new as a G space. Okay. So in short, the person boundary of the product, this is the product of person boundaries with this choice of measures. Okay. okay so this is. Uh, there's one thing, but uh, I'm not so much interested in the group G, but, but rather as a lattice in G. So gamma will be uh, a lattice in G with uh, dense projections. So we put that the lattice it means that gamma is discrete in G, and that the um, the, the, the homogeneous space G mod gamma carries a G variant quality measure, which is then the same. And what does it mean that the lattice is with dense projections? It means that when I project gamma onto G1 and G2, this is this. Okay? So, for instance, one, one example will be 
is, for instance, SA2 C adjunct uh, UD in two copies of SA2. Another example uh, involving uh, PLX is SA2 uh, C adjoint one of the P inside SA2 R minus uh, SA2 P. Of course, what I do here for SA2, it, it works for any SLM, of course, and you also have more um, uh, geometric examples. For instance, you have like uh, interesting examples of uh, uniform lattices and products of trees by the work of Eugene Moses. And there are also these nice examples of uh, Katzmann groups, uh, discrete Katzmann groups acting like on the twin uh, buildings. Uh, but these are, you know, uh, usually, you know, um, the easiest example in uh, almost simple product of almost simple groups. So, what is the, the classical settings? Uh, the, the classical theorem here. Uh, so, it's uh, it's the dimensional factor theorem. And we in this theorem, this is an extension of uh, Margulis factor theorem. Uh, so, what does it say? And um, instead of studying it for um, uh, factor maps, I will study it for abelian phenomenal algebras, and it's the same, but uh, this will take us then to the non inductive framework uh, in a more natural way. So what do I mean by this? So I'm going to look at um, I'm going to look at uh, a infinity of b with the dimension class u d. So this is uh, what we call an abelian Feynman algebra. And inside, I'm going to take a subalgebra, a Feynman subalgebra. So it's a subalgebra that is a uh, C-star subalgebra. So it's uh, Uniformly closed, it contains the unit stable and the uh, but also it's weak star closed. Okay, so L infinity has the weak star topology, and I want it to be weak star closed. So let's a from the man subalgebra, and actually I will take it to be gamma invariant. You see, you see, on B you have the G action, and I restrict the G action just to a gamma action. Okay, and I look at this as gamma acting on this abelian. Uh, and an algebra by just pre composing. So I act on functions on the space. And so I will assume that this is a gamma invariant from the math of algebra. Then, um, already we have a very nice uh, structure theorem. Then, what they show is that then, then, um, equals one or two, there exists some uh, unique uh, CI mu CI, and this is a GI mu I boundary. So this is a quotient which you want of the Poisson boundary, so this is a mu I boundary, GI mu I boundary, such that, such that, uh, a is as isomorphic as a gamma algebra, as a gamma feminine algebra. So this is, uh, yeah, so Vn permits the algebra sphere that's like one of them. Sometimes called double du star algebra. We have six star algebra. And double new star algebra is like a system algebra, but it's also something more. It's like a, so I had to a dual of the balance. I think that's the system algebra. So for every A one to I G. Yes. So for every Y in one two, there exists a unique CI and mu CI. And this for me, this is a quotient of the Poisson boundary. So this is a GI and UI boundary. So, so, uh, okay, so our group is, is, is also a product. Okay. okay. 
No, no, it's contained in the product. So A as a gamma to the manage bra, this is isomorphic to A infinity of C1 times C2. And with the main class, uh, mu C1 times mu C2. Mm. So the situation is quite rigid because, um, so if you prefer to say it in, in terms of factors, it means that any gamma factor of B is isomorphic as a gamma space to a product of Boundaries for G1 and G. Okay. So and these are actually some algebra solved, right? The, this uh, oh, this VI B2 uh, some common common model. Yes. Yes, so that's uh, that of course yeah. so, yes, so that's of course so the thing is that whenever you have a factor, so whenever you have a factor map, it right? whenever you have a factor map. It's the same thing as like an inclusion. Yeah. I always use this um, yeah. all the time. Yeah. I don't why the reason the reason why I say it for a big end to the manager, of course it sounds like a gadget you know, and things like this, but we see the parallel you know, with the theorem I want to say. Okay, so the basic equilibrium. So yes, so basically in short, any gamma factor of the, the, the Poisson boundary, this is a product of uh, boundaries. And here what's interesting to notice is that really the assumption is that it's a gamma factor, a gamma in my opinion, not the G in my opinion. Okay. So this is quite uh, so this is quite uh, quite remarkable. So this type of theorem was put way earlier by Margulis, and it was done in the setting of um, um, semi-simple algebraic groups. So of course this, this theorem recovers Margulis theorem in the non-simple case, but of course Margulis theorem also works in the simple case, higher in simple in groups, and this of course is not covered by this theorem. What's remarkable here is that it's, uh, it's extremely general. And, uh, and the book is really nice, not, not complicated, but, but really beautiful. And it's really proven out of thin air. Basically, you have no structure. You don't need to know, you don't need to assume anything about the group in G, G1 and G, which is quite remarkable. One application of this, like Margulis, so the factor of theorem is it's used in, in, in many settings, but one, um, one truly remarkable application is the normal subgroup theorem, right? So, for hybrid lattices, you have the normal subgroup theorem saying that whenever you have a, a, a hybrid lattice, any any normal uh, any uh, normal subgroup is either finite or it has finite index, right? And the proof goes like this: so if you have a non-central, non-finite, say normal subgroup, to prove that the quotient is finite, Margulis showed that it is both a minimal and it has cohesivity, and this. Tool here allows you to prove the property T hat of this, not the, the property, the amenability hat of this, sorry. Property T hat, it uses the Shalom's uh, reduced cohomology, I will not talk about this. But one application is, is something like this, and it's, it's nice to say this way. So one application is what we call the amenability hat. Keep the same setting here, and let's end in a a normal sub. And we would like to understand when uh, the portion is minimal. So then, the portion is you know what the name is minimal. So this is what we want to understand, basically. And the portion name is amenable if and only for every i. Then the portion of g i and one, the projection of n onto g i closure is amenable. And so here, what I denote by p i, p i is just the 
Suppose, assuming that gamma mod n is a minimum, this is very easy to deduce that this is a minimum, this is just the size. And the half hour force is to go the other way around, and this is the direction that is of interest because we want to prove that, you know, we want to understand uh, portions of these two groups arising as they exist. And it it's suffices to prove this. And so to go from right to left, it uses this result, but it uses another important ingredient, which is uh, this characterization of a minimal groups, which is due to uh, uh, Kaiman and Dijkarchik uh, and also Rosenbach, I think, that uh, a group is minimal, even on if uh, there exists an admissible measure such that the Poisson boundary is true. Okay. Um, so, this is what I wanted to mention. And for instance, you see right away that uh, if you assume, for instance, that the group G1 and G2 they are topologically simple. Well, this, this, con this condition, you know, will be will be satisfied, you know, as soon as the PIN is different from the identity, right? Because then the closure will be, uh, a, a, you know, a non-trivial normal subgroup, and then the quotient has to be uh, has to be trivial. Okay. Yeah. So this this condition is very easy to satisfy if you put some extra assumption on G one and G two, and then you get this. So, for instance, um, this aminability part, you can prove it very easily. If you assume, for instance, that G1 and G2 say have a uh, tau more property or you know, a topological simple or something like this. So it gives a very elegant proof in, in this way. Okay, so this is one of the applications I wanted to, to mention. And now I want to switch to um, uh, the main the main theorem I want to do about the I keep the same framework. Okay, I keep the same the same notation, but we will move to a to a, to a non commutative setting. So let me explain what I mean by this. The main. So there is a construction in the operator algebra that is extremely general, so I will use different methods um, not to mess with the notation of stairs. So let's assume that we have a, a countable discrete group lambda acting from a measured space by um, not necessarily measure preserving transformation, but by transformation that preserves the measure case, right? So we call this. Uh, I like to call this a non simple action or an action that quasi preserves the measure. Then there is a way, and it's the so called uh, group measure space construction, group measure space, group measure space uh, construction. And this is due to Murray and Fundelman. Uh, Around, uh, around 1940 or something, maybe 37, I don't remember exactly. And there is a way to uh, construct a fundamental algebra. So, a fundamental algebra. So, what does it mean to be a fundamental algebra? It means that uh, that's actually very concretely will act on a uh, given space. And this is uh, a subalgebra of the bounded operator on the certain input space, uh, namely little L2 of lambda tensor uh, L2 of this. So there is a very natural way to construct this. And this fundamental algebra is naturally generated by a copy of the group, actually, a copy of the left regular of the group, and a copy of any infinity of the space. And these two copies interact with each other, and you have like a semi direct uh, product construction, something like this. So there is like a uh, 
some sort of uh, representation of you from the unitary of let's call this maybe uh, I don't know, let's call this maybe M. So you have like a, a unitary representation, it's like a unitary representation, and you have also uh, a star here from any unit of X to uh, M. And these two properties they interact with each other and they satisfy the following relation. So any gamma and lambda and any function f in n infinity, you have the following uh, covariance formula. So when you conjugate the function f by u gamma, basically what you obtain is a function decomposed uh, with gamma index. And so M is generated as a phenomenon of dress. So it's, it's the phenomenon that you are generated by the U gamma and the type. Gamma is gamma, is lambda, and F is the type. So we're not really bothering with the construction. It's not so important, but uh, there is a way to do it. And this phenomenon of kind of encode somehow the group and the action. So, for instance, if uh, the action lambda and x is uh, essentially free and uh, a break, then the so called group measure space construction is, uh, is a factor. So, factor, this is a phenomenon of the with the trivial center. And um, and uh, it's actually possible to compute the type of this factor, and the type of this factor will be the trigger type of uh, the action. Oh. And I think this puts uh, the main result I'm about to say in a um, in, a, in, a, in an interesting perspective. The important remark is that assume that you have like a, a, a full of unit in space. Assume that you have a full So a, a lambda equivalent to okay, So assume that y theta is a portion of x. Then, of course, naturally, as I said, I mean, it's, it gives you know, an inclusion of any input of y inside uh, n field of s. And actually, because the, the portion is lambda equivalent, you can do this, of course, also at the level of the phenomenon uh, algebra. So, what we have is an inclusion. So, then we have l lambda sitting inside l lambda acting on y and inside. L of lambda acting on S. <laughs> right? So you see that lambda and lambda acting on X was my initial data. And then I notice that if I have a lambda quotient, I have this intermediate from the non algebra inside. Right? So we have like a, it's an intermediate. Uh, so the question is, uh, given an action, do, can we have a, a precise description of all intermediate fundamental subjects? So do we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between intermediate factors or factors and uh, intermediate fundamental subjects? In general, no. Okay. So they are like. Uh, it's possible to construct in a kind of systematic way a uh, counterexample. This was done by um, Suzuki. So in general, no. But uh, I'm going to stay on the positive side here, and I'm going to state a result that's positive, and that has to do with the Poisson boundary. And uh, 
So in order to state my result, I need two um, two other extra assumptions. Um, one is is pretty natural um, when we want to understand. Uh, typically, we would want that the non trivial element in the group acts free or essentially free on the space. So <clears throat> I'm gonna put some sort of ad hoc uh, definition here, but um, we can be able to do something very general for any of the like H. So, and uh, mu. Uh, the invisible measure. And I'm going to say that the pair H mu that satisfies the um, the boundary freeness condition, the boundary freeness condition, if whenever H is not in the center of H, but of course the center of H will like trigger than the person boundary, so I have to exceed this. But uh, whenever H is not in the center of H, so I want that uh, the element H, uh, for every H, I don't know, and every, um, and every uh, non trivial H mu boundary, so not only just the Poisson boundary, but in fact any non trivial boundary. So for any element that is not central and any non trivial boundary, I want a set of fixed points of H in C to be zero, of measure zero, right? So I want that whenever I have a non-trivial boundary and whenever I have a non-central element, I want that my element acts essentially free on the boundary. So I want the measure of the set of points that are fixed by H to have zero measure. You said don't go on the boundary on any new boundary. On any new, on any non trivial new boundary, yes. Just not just that here. So, in fact, there are plenty of examples like this. Uh, so, I don't want include uh, uh, some simple um, algebraic groups. Uh, and also, so this is quite strong assumption, we can make it work also for groups, certain groups are two trees. I will not even go into this, but uh, I want to mention this. And the other uh, notion that I need, this is more classical. Um, this is really from uh, group theory. <laughs> and the other notion that I need is the notion of the quasi center of the topological group. So, what is the quasi center? If you have a, a topological group, a topological group, so the quasi center of H, this is the set of elements in H such that the the centralizer of H in H is open. So these are the sets of, these are the elements in the group such that the centralizer is big, right? It's an open set. So there are two situations where this quasi-centralizer is trivial, or well, it's, it's understood what it is. So of course, uh, some remarks. So if H is uh, connected, then the, the quasi center is just the center. Right, because the only open subgroup, this is the group itself. And if H is discrete, then the, the quasi center is a Right, because you have the discrete approach. So this is kind of um, uh, 
uh, notion that is only really interesting for totally disconnected but non discrete groups. Okay, basically, this is um, another interesting example is when you have a group acting on a tree. Uh, such that uh, non compact, such that the, the action on the boundary is too transitive, then the quasi center is trivial. This, so this is the result due to uh, Virgin Moses. It's quite interesting. And also, in the case of uh, a simple algebraic group, uh, basically the quasi center will be equal to the center. Okay. So, Okay, so now I, I want to say the the, the, the non commutative version of uh, the Bader Shalom theorem. So the setup is the same, but uh, to make the proof work, we, we need some extra assumptions that uh, have to do with the fact that we need to deal with the non commutative object and we need to deal with the group column algebra, basically. So we need to put some, some extra assumptions to, to get the result. Okay, so the result is like this. So it's the same setup as before. Okay, so I have um, a gamma, a lattice, a lattice with uh, uh, dense projections, and I'm assuming the following things. I need some extra assumptions compared to the better shadow. So first of all, I want the center of the lattice to be finite. Let's speak in the way, the more classical examples. I want that for every i equals one or two. I want my group uh, G plane to be well behaved. So that I want the quasi center to be equal to the center. And the third assumption is that um, uh, for every i also, I want the pair to be um, the pair to satisfies the satisfies the the, the boundary freeness measure. And again, in, in most, in, in most, um, uh, in many examples, this is satisfied. Most, for instance, for uh, simple algebraic groups or for groups acting on trees, this test will be satisfied. Okay, so then I'm going to, uh, then I'm going to consider now lambda, which is the quotient of lambda by the center. So why do I go out by the center? It's because you see, because gamma is with dense projections in, uh, in uh, G1 and G2. So in particular, the center of gamma will be contained in the product of the centers of G1 and G2. And it's well known that for a group, the, the center of the group acts trivially on the Poisson boundary. So if I want to avoid any pathology where I would have, you know, uh, some elements from the group from the manager that that maps trivially on the person boundary, I, I need to remove this, you know, because otherwise the statement is not so nice. So rather than looking at the gamma action, I prefer to look at the lambda action, so gamma not the center. Extremely natural, because Z gamma acts trivially on the group. So then there is, let me write it like this, so then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, Intermediate prominence of algebras. So this is the whole intermediate prominence of algebras, and and uh, lambda factors, lambda factors of E, mu B. And we know what they are, right? We know that by the Bader Shalom factor, we know they are known, right? They are products of boundaries. So all the all these lambda factors, you know, they arise as you know C uh, new C, which is the product of C1 new C1 times uh, C2 new C. Okay. 
Okay, so all these lambda, all these lambda factors, and they are given by this, right? This is the reference theorem I, I said before. Okay, and so we have a one to one, one to one correspondence. So, <clears throat> so this this result is uh, is interesting because we can apply it to uh, the setting of semi-simple algebraic groups. We can also apply it to the setting of uh, uh, groups acting on trees. So it gives us all information for uh, the Georgian of the surfaces. And when you apply this to a uh, framework of semi simple algebraic groups, we get something that's extremely interesting. So, of course, when I say we apply it to the case of uh, algebraic groups, this theorem, of course, only works when you have a product structure. So here I state it for products of two, but we can also say for products of say k group. But of course, it doesn't say anything when I have just one group. So it doesn't say anything about lattices in simple groups. No, we need a product structure. But if I uh, if I apply this with a previous result that we proved with uh, Remy, uh, with the name and Walter, we obtain the following very interesting consequence. We obtain the following very interesting consequence. I will be very um, very vague about the assumptions, but um, let me take to simplify uh, high and values. Let me take of high and values. And to simplify, let's assume that that's two mils and with two mils and It has finite center in general, but let's assume that it does um, triple center. And then what is the Poisson boundary in this case? It's well known, it's a result due to uh, just in there. In the case of uh, uh, really groups, and this was generalized by Valer and Sean to the case of algebraic groups over undefined local fields. But now you are, we have a one to one correspondence between uh, all. Us, and we have a lot of one correspondence with intermediate parallel surfaces. These are the sets of parallel surfaces. Right? And what's interesting here is that um, we know exactly how many parabolic subgroups there are. Right? So here they are precisely. The number of parabolic subgroups is precisely two to the brain of G. So here yeah, I should be a bit more precise because if G is a product, I need to take the sum of the of the rank with respect to the local field. But uh, let's just do that. And so it's saying particular that here you see in that situation, it means that between the fundamental algebra of the group. And the fundamental algebra of the action, it means that they are precisely exactly two to the brain intermediate fundamental subversions. Right? So it says that basically it says that the rank of G this becomes an invariant. This becomes an invariant of the inclusion. Right? It's an invariant of the inclusion because precisely two to the brain is exactly the number of intermediate fundamental subversions. And there is in the field of fundamental algebra, there is um, a celebrated conjecture by Alan Cohn that asks whether the rank of the ambient B group or semi simple algebraic group is an invariant algorithm, right? So basically, the, the DGT conjecture says that if I have two higher lattices that have the same fundamental algebra, does it imply that the ambient B groups have the same rank? Mm -hmm. So what we show here is that assume that we have all higher lattices that have isomorphic fundamental algebra. So they are here. Okay? I'm not going to just I'm going to wave my hands. But, um... Okay, so we have L gamma one and L gamma. Let's assume that they are isomorphic. They are the same. 
we would like to show, and uh, it's very to show that <laughs> the lead groups have the same rank, okay? Uh, we cannot do this yet, uh, not for me, but at least we can say something. Because assume that this isomorphism, we can lift this isomorphism, is really to an isomorphism of the pairs, right? L gamma one inside gamma one and F one G one P one, and same for gamma. So assume that just having an isomorphism of the group in the manner of that, we really have an isomorphism of this of these inclusions. So because the inclusions are isomorphic, it means that necessarily they must have exactly the same uh, number of intermediate fundamental subalgebras on each side. So precisely, they would have the same rank. So this is what I mean when I say that the rank is an environment. So one, one way to tackle Kohn's rigidity conjecture would be to um, would be to prove that actually starting from L gamma, we can kind of uh, reconstruct in a canonical way uh, the inclusion of L gamma in sense. But this is no easy task because as you as you may know, of course, when we construct the Poisson boundary, we choose the probability measure on the group, so it's highly sensitive to the probability measure that we choose, okay? So maybe this is not exactly the way to look at it, but um, there are definitely some um, uh, some ideas here to explore. Okay? Uh, this is what I want to say. So at least it, it gives um, I think it gives a little hope to uh, tackle uh, Kohn's conjecture, or at least to make you know, some extra assumptions. This is what I mean. Um, So I guess I have only because I, I started a bit. Um, yeah, you have to be started at least five minutes. Yes. Later, so Maybe yeah. I have like four or five minutes. Yes. I will not even go into the proof, but just let me just give you a hint of what's going on and actually why do we need to sort of do extra things. So what would be kind of the, the, the general strategy to prove this? Essentially, it consists of three steps. And at least I can explain this and then I will stop. So, yeah, to prove this theorem, so I uh, think there are two steps. One step we have something to do, and the other step we just take a result from the lead group. So let's assume that we have M uh, inside an intermediate subalgebra, but let's assume that it's not equal to, let's assume that it's not equal to B. So then we would like to show that uh, M is of the form A of lambda on C. We have seen at the form you know, C1 times C2, okay? And, uh, and then C1 or C2 is not true because uh, this is different from L1, right? So the first step, and this is really the crucial step, this is where the, the hard work is done, consists, consists of showing that let us see some I. And there exists some uh, non trivial um, uh, GI boundaries, so non trivial interim CI and UCI, such that anything for CI is inside them. So basically, the fact that M is not equal to M lambda, this actually forces M to contain. At least a portion of the space left over, a non trivial portion of the space to a non trivial boundary. And then for the second step, this is where we use a uh, reason to uh, Suzuki. Actually, it's a fairly recent people. Um, and Suzuki showed the following thing he showed that uh, assume that you have a, a factor map. 
So it's completely abstract. It's like for discrete groups of on measure spaces. So we showed that um, we showed the following thing. So we'll assume that you have X team and the quotient here is an eta. And let's assume that you have uh, lambda factors. And, <clears throat> and let's assume that here the lambda action on the space below is essentially free. So of course it will force the action to be essentially free upstairs. And it shows that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between intermediate factors and exactly what we want. Intermediate subalgebras. Okay. Yes. Intermediate between uh, the smaller group measure space construction into the larger group measure space. So you might say, well, wait a minute, is it, isn't it what you want to prove? Yes, indeed. But Suzuki, he makes a crucial assumption. He needs the intermediate subalgebra to already contain something from the space on which the group acts. And this basically this is what we do in the first step. In the first step, we just assume that n is different from n one. But then you know how how can you prove that something comes from the space? Well, this is basically what we do. Okay. So this is of course the hard part. And then once we have something from the space, because lambda is acting essentially free in here, we can then invoke Suzuki's result. So we have this one-to-one -one correspondence and invoke basically Suzuki's result and also again uh, So this is how the, the strategy uh, goes. And this is where this, in this first step, we, so here, this is where basically we use the boundary freeness condition to be able to apply Suzuki's result. And for the first step, we use um, sort of the machinery that we developed with uh, Uri Bader and uh, uh, Remy Boutonnet and Jesse Peterson. Where we put some sort of naval Zimmer theorem for products. And uh, this is where also in the first part we use the assumption that the, the, the product center is infinite. This I have, don't have time to explain, but at least I wanted to uh, give you the overall strategy. Thank you. Questions or Monsieur? What do you still discreet. Still discreet. So this I don't know because I, I don't know in general if you just have uh, a discrete subject uh, with this projection, but without being a lattice, I don't know because at some point we uh, we both in the commutative case and non commutative case, even better shalom, they they use the fact that it's a lattice because they reduce. So if you don't have a lattice, uh, then probably it will not it will not work, even the commutative. Uh, well, take you even take uh, take the Zeiss events, even take the Zeiss events, you know, so good to let's say we are, that doesn't satisfy you know, the normal sort of theory, right? So you have three groups uh, that are Zeiss events, so, so the fact that it's a lattice is very crucial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, exactly. This is what I said. It's, 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 it's part of your result that there are finite domains in this. Ah, so in this setting, yes, in this one, because in the other one, it's yeah, it's clear. Yeah. Uh, in this setting, well, you will have as many factors, many factors, factors but, but here you will have you know, know, like maybe you may have continuum factors. And in, in, in that setting, and the finite is very rigid. But the finiteness is also like part of your result, or can you? No, no, no. This this was known. So the fact that. This is like a structural result on some asymptote leading. No, but I mean for the factors, but for the for algebra. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the, like, the fact that there are finite domains in the F. No, that would not know. That was not known. That's also what's the first thing behind the first. And then yes. it's the equal to the last one. Because you see, what's, what's, really, uh, what's really kind of remarkable in a way is that you have this intermediate subalgebra that contains the group, but 
how do you show yeah, exactly that part, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact that you yeah. that it has the structure of the part part, how do you put that into composers, right? So it's like um yeah, so that it was not English. Yeah. Actually, that I think to me, to my knowledge, that result, this is the first result where we can recover the grain in terms of fundamental algebras in a non trivial way, like just here. Um, yeah. Uh, I have another question on the uh, in general. On the, when, when you have a group preserving a middle class, you always have this inclusion of uh, Ada Mai and Kinsman. And I know that for Z action, she could be a group preserving one. There's been some work by, by Nashville Yet Turner where they show that entropy is preserved and they asked if we can see uh, these. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So we need to. There is, we need to pay attention to the fact that if the action is not uh, totally measured, then this algebra A can be inside. This is a very good sign, but there is no uh, normal condition of expectation. So then there is no tangible uh, way to push things from the front row to the group of the So there is. Uh, a, a normal condition of expectation of then it takes place for this. But not a gamma, no. So then, you know, even if you think things like this, these notions of uh, mixing for subalgebras, you need you need an expectation, you need a condition. So you need to push it. Any other uh, uh, Yeah, so Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to resume in just a few minutes with a second talk by Sarah, right? No, no. no by Colonel. No. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs>